In 1848, Paris alone hosted around 300 of such associations with around 50,000 members. So what Charles Fourier had originally conceived, conceived of for agricultural context would become the leading slogan for the organization of the industrial working class. Marx refers to these historical connotations of the term association too, famously so in the Communist Manifesto. I quote, in place of the old bourgeois society with its classes and class antagonisms, we shall have an association in which the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all. Again and again, association describes a form of societal organization that functions as means and end for the egalitarian organization of society. What Marx finds in it is a description of the workers' potential to communally manage the production and distribution of metric material wealth on both a smaller and larger on both a smaller and larger scale. From the German ideology and the communist manifesto to the third volume of capital, just as much as in England's later writings, this use of the term association can be found as a description of socialist politics and of working class self organization. Freud's use of the concept of association stems from the second history of associations. And this story begins with John Locke rather than with Rousseau, and it is evident that these two stories, stories of the concept of association, do not have a common. In the history of epistemological and psychological associationism, concerns of societal organization and of political resistance do not even come to mind. With Locke, the story begins as an analysis of proper and improper forms of thought. Locke adds in 1700 a chapter on the association of ideas, which is in fact the title of the chapter, to the fourth edition of his essay concerning <coughs> understanding. Here, associations appear as wrong connections of ideas, typical for madmen and children, opposed to proper rationality. Associations are connected with madness, but already Locke had to admit that such a quote, degree of madness can be found in most men. In Scottish Enlightenment, then, the concept of association would temporarily lose this stigma and make his extraordinary career. Francis Hutchison would find an aesthetic principle in association that allows to explain the enjoyment of aesthetic contents in indeterminate openness. In the further development of Scottish aesthetics, Alexander Gerard and Archibald Ellison would develop an aesthetic theory of association in which the imaginary reconstruction of the lost world is at stake in which association is connected to the aesthetic genius. The open and intrinsic connectivity of ideas serves as the major paradigm of the aesthetic. David Hume then, most influentially but quite differently, would try, try to take the phenomenon of association epistemologically seriously to classify different types of association, such as resemblance, contiguity, and cause and effect. But it is also you who, to a large extent, anticipates the questions and problems of psychoanalysis when you detect in its inquiry concerning, concerning human understanding, of course. Even in our wildest and most wandering reveries, nay, in our very dreams, we shall find, if we reflect, that the imagination ran not altogether at adventures, but that there, was a, that there was still a connection of held among the different ideas which succeeded each other. Were the loosest and freest conversation to be transcribed, there would immediately be observed something which connected it in all its transitions. With Locke, Hutchison, Ellison, Gerard, and probably most importantly, Hume, the origin of the concept of association is British. It is, however, this German interpretation that dominates the 19th century. The expansion of associationism in Germany is affected by 19th century scientism and materialism, looking for psychophysical laws which might explain the emergence and connection of ideas. In the foundational discourse on the discipline of psychology, Johann Friedrich Herbert would turn association into a subject of the special sciences, pursuing the idea of an experimental psychology, Gustav Theodor Fechner and Wilhelm Mundwill, shortly after, try to discover elementary laws concerning the relation between the world of bodies and the world of mind. Association is no longer only regarded as a mental phenomenon, but is seen in close relation with bodily states and neurological impulses. 
It is against the backdrop of these traditions that Freud develops free association as a method. That much of the material and spirit of 19th century scientism remains in his interest in laws of association and the hidden bodily logic by which it is driven. Spontaneous free association provides Freud with non-restricted expressions that allow to decode the structure of the unconscious, its indigenous drives, and the history that has crystallized it. Free association is, in structure, an egalitarian and anti-representational method, as Montalus and Lacan define, I quote, according to which voice must be given to all thoughts, without exception, which enter the mind, whether such, whether such thoughts are based upon a specific element, word, number, green image, or any kind of idea at all, or produced spontaneously. The so-called fundamental rule of psychoanalysis promises to disclose the secrets of the human psyche. It reveals the madness, madness as it is to be found in most men, as John Locke has said, and clarifies the hidden laws which connect our ideas even in our very dreams, just as David Hume has assumed. And come to my second part on ontologies and methods. In the context of the history of ideas, it is easy to tell how two conceptions of association differ. Yet there is a certain connection between the two uses of the term that appears to be interesting. The analogous use of the term in Marx and Freud might not be a great coincidence. So what about the theoretical relation between the two? My point, however, is certainly not to simply add social theory to psychoanalysis or some psychology to Marxism, or to read one with regard to the other. In his 1987 text, Psychoanalysis and Marxism, Ernesto Laclau has claimed that adding the theoretical benefits of theory to the other cannot be of the slightest use. The problem, he argues, and I quote, is rather that of finding an index of comparison between two different theoretical fields, but that in turn implies the construction of a new field in which the comparison makes sense. The Klaus sees, as he writes, I quote again, the coincidence of the two around the logic of the signifier as the logic of unevenness and dislocation, end quote. The structural logic of repression and denial in the order of representation. According to Laclau, the structural similarity is finally ontological. And as the ontolo ontology of Marx and Freud is concerned, I agree with Laclau in the long tradition of structural structuralist readings of Marx and Freud. But the index of comparison goes one step further than the structural and affinities of ontology. It encloses a particular method too. It is a specific structural approach that unites Marx and Freud, and this structural approach can be laid bare with respect to the use of the term association. The logic of the signifier as a logic of unevenness and dislocation, as Laclau has called it, alludes to a specifically ontolog ontological construction that Marx and Freud share. Both of them are dealing with a specific form of manifest being that conceals its latent and dynamic ground, of which it is at the same time a product. As Freud confronts the symbolic sphere of articulated speech with the hidden ground of the unconscious, Marx confronts the institutional sphere of state and capital with the logics of material production. In both of their theories, the symbolic sphere is confronted with some hidden dynamics of production, production now in a very metaphorical sense, of course, that are structurally excluded from the apparent logics of representation. Four elements, at least, are central for both ontologies. Both describe, firstly, the order of representation, speech on the one hand, value and political representation on the other, as implicitly linked to a productive and dynamic ground. The villainous unconscious energies and material practices are the driving forces in symbolic and historical practices. The dynamic core of representation is thus materially concrete for both. Secondly, Freud and Marx conceive of this pr productive and dynamic ground of the symbolic as being structurally hidden. Ideology in the case of Marx, Marx repression and censorship in the case of Freud are driven by the forces of and denial. Capital and the state deny the reality of class by which they are secretly, secretly determined as they establish universal orders of representation, 